It's four o'clock on a Thursday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Woohoo! And guess who ate too many of those chocolate covered coffee beans from Trader Joe's? Yours truly! Woohoo! <laughs> and thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. I, Carly Rocks. Hello, everybody. Let me say hello to the folks in the chat room. <clears throat> oh, I didn't do my daily me, 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 warm up before the big show. Uh, hello, who do we have? We have Darren Moss, Bob Gunnerfelt, Ian Shortle, Akira Canyon, Dan Weber, Andre Stepanian, which I will show this at greater length in a moment. Um, Andre Stepanian, Nancy Kalel, Edmund Red. Uh, Kual, Jose, Riffs That Rule, Darren Moss, um, uh, let's see, Rose Winters, Rick Cabot, Podmore, Alex Dillon, Daryl Berman, Dave Merkel, Pete Mason, and Ariana. Uh, hello from Adelaide. Hello, Darren Wilson. How are you? Alan McCool. Hello. Bob Gunnerfeld, just in case I missed you. John Pearson. How are you, buddy? Hey, I want to let you guys know right at the top of the show, um, tomorrow I'm calling, um, oh, Russell Landwehr. Um, Russell's been a member for a number of years. He's uh, helped us with stuff at the road rally. Um, just a, a great guy. He's become a friend, as many of you have over the years. Hello, Pete Mason, Trev Fury. Uh, he just retired after God knows how many years of being a lineman for the phone company. I know, I know. It makes me want to sing the song as well. And uh, so he's got nothing but time on his hands now to work on his music. And he's a relatively young guy. I think he's only like 83, 84. No, he, I, if I had to guess, I would guess that Russell's in his late 40s, maybe. Maybe he's older and he hides it well. I don't know. He's in good shape. He's been crawling under crawl spaces, climbing up telephone poles, going face to face with raccoons, possums, or should I say opossums, um, and birds on a wire all these years. And he's done. He's out. I am so envious that he gets to work on music all day, every day. Hello, Pete Mason. How are you? Peter Rayhill, Jonathan Morse. Um, yeah, it does sound fun. You know, uh, I often wonder when that day comes that I do retire, will I be bored? Or will I do what Cass McKenty does, which is play with goats all day? As a matter of fact, where do I have that? I've got to show you guys um, Bird on a Wire, another song reference. Yeah, there's also a Goldie Hawn movie called Bird on a Wire, I believe. Um, let me see if I can find the cutest damn goat video you have probably ever seen. You know, it's so frustrating. Can never find what I want to find in a hurry um, on my phone. All right, here we go. <laughs> I mean, really. Who needs dogs or cats when you've got baby goats? There is really nothing cuter. Maybe your own baby. Maybe not. I don't know. Goats are pretty cute. <laughs> anyway, um, I just, I love that. Uh, actually, Liz from the staff sent me that. Um, someday, I am going to own goats. Uh, that's not Cass's house, but Cass has a couple of goats that are not much bigger than those. Uh, yeah, baby goats. Um, they're just adorable. So anyway, uh, yeah, tomorrow we're going to, maybe we should prank Russell Landwehr. 
I once did that to a former business partner of mine in the studio. <laughs> okay, here's a true confession for you. Um, I had a partner uh, named Doug. Who, he and I were best friends and business partners in, in uh, Triad Recording Studios in Fort Lauderdale back in like the late 70s into the early 80s. And uh, I actually had a, a friend that was the A&R coordinator for Capitol Records. And uh, so <laughs> I can't believe I did this to him. I really can't. I've, I've always felt terrible about this. Uh, we had her call the studio. He was the business end of the studio. I was the control room guy at the studio. We had her call up um, and inquire if the studio was available, top secret, uh, the Beatles were getting back together for a reunion. Um, I think it was all the Beatles were still alive, and I think it was... Anyway, um, he bought it hook, line, and sinker, and she actually booked a date for a tour of the studio and everything, and the day came, and he was out in front of the studio smoking a cigarette, pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth, and uh, they never arrived because the whole thing, we were just pranking him. And when I told him, he threw a beer at me. He walked out and didn't come back for about a month. And I felt so terrible. Such a good guy, such a dear friend. We all just thought it was the funniest thing in the world. Not that funny. Anyway, there you go. Yeah, that was brutal. He was so excited. Uh, and we almost actually had John Lennon, almost, had he not sadly been killed, John Lennon probably would have mixed some of Double Fantasy at my studio. Reason being, he and Yoko had just purchased a house in Palm Beach not long before that. And um, he was looking, uh, I can't remember who produced Double Fantasy. Uh, I can't remember his name right now. Here, I know, I will ask my phone. Um, Who produced the Double Fantasy record? Jack Douglas. Jack Douglas. Okay. So um, one day we're at the studio working, doing what we could do. You know, I, I think I might have actually been in a Neil Young session. And uh, Jack Douglas just showed up. Walked in the lobby out of the clear blue. You got to remember, back then there were not that many studios around. Um, in South Florida at the time, I think there were two or three pro studios, like real legit pro studios. Anyway, uh, so Jack Douglas just walks in and he said, I'm not making any promises, but I'm working with John Lennon on a solo record and uh, he and Yoko uh, and the kids are gonna spend the winter in Palm Beach. And we're thinking about doing some of the vocals and some of the mixing here in South Florida. And I looked in the yellow pages because the internet didn't exist. And I looked in the yellow pages and I found your studio and you are the closest pro level studio to Palm Beach. So here I am. Do you mind if I have a look around? Um, and we gave him the five or 10 minute tour. We played him a couple things in the control room. Uh, actually probably wasn't a Neil Young day because Neil wouldn't have probably wanted me to bring somebody in the control room, even Jack Douglas, who was a pretty famous producer back then. Might still be today. Anyway, um, Jack said, thank you very much. And he walked out to the lobby, said, oh, by the way, do you mind if I use your phone? And uh, I said, sure. So he picks up the phone in the lobby and he called John Lennon from our lobby phone to say, I think I've got the place. Place looks good. It's in a secure location. Sounds really good. Think we got the place. And uh, Jack hung up the phone. He looked at me and said, thank you very much. We'll get back to you. And uh, it was probably about three weeks later when John Lennon was killed. So there you go. Anyway, um, Dave Merkel says, I've heard Jack talk about that album, Amazing Backstories. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, Bonzo230 would love to talk about sound design on one of these quarantini. Ooh, QAH. QHH. There you go. That's the abbreviated version of Quarantini Happy Hour. 
the tomato plant update. Ooh, glad you asked, Nancy. Um, the tomato plant update is I took the big potted one that was on our patio that was producing a lot of tomatoes that were supposed to be big ones, but they were all coming out about the size of a ping pong ball. They're really tasty, but not that big. And I could tell it was outgrowing the pot it was in. It was in a pretty large pot, uh, you know, in a basket. It was like, you know, three, four feet tall in a pot about, well, you can't really see, but you know, I think the pot was about 14 to 16 inches wide, probably close to a foot deep, but it had outgrown the pot. So I took it out yesterday and planted that sucker in the backyard uh, next to its brethren, the other tomato plants. And uh, it's a little shrivelly looking today. I think it's going through a little bit of shock, but I did my best when I planted it. I put some, you know, really nice organic soil down in the hole, put some fertilizer in there, made sure everything was nice and moist. Took that baby out of that pot, lowered it in there, filled it in with some more of that beautiful organic soil as opposed to the chemical laden soil. Uh, and then put some fertilizer on it and then watered it and watered it again this morning. So hopefully it gets over the shock, bounces back. Um, and the big tomatoes on the other plant have not been eaten by the squirrel or the rabbit. Happy to report that. Um, Darren Moss, I am. I always monitor these episodes. Of course she does. I need a monitor. You know, actually, back when we were still in the office in the pre-COVID era, um, uh, first Bria and then Ariana would sit across my desk from me, you know, with, I always say within kicking range of me. It's a little warm in here. I think I need to make it a little cooler. Oh, yeah. There we go. It was 77 degrees, way too hot under the studio lights today. And I'm also breaking the rules. I'm wearing a white shirt on camera, but you know what? That's just the kind of guy I am. I'm a rule breaker. Uh, so let's go back to the Andre Stepanian fishing picture. <laughs> there he is. In all of his glory. I'm guessing the, that looks like a steelhead, Andre. Correct me if I'm wrong. So I need to know, where were you fishing? And I'm guessing that thing is about pound and three quarters, two pounds maybe? I don't know. Is it, in fact, a steelhead? Yeah, by the way, I'm printing out the other pictures when we get more ink in the printer. <laughs> After this one was done, it sucked most of the colored ink out of the printer, so got to re-up on the ink. Um, oh, it's a coho salmon. Okay. Um, and where did you catch that beautiful fish? Giovanni Lanza. Wow, somebody caught a medium-sized shark here today. Where, where do you live, Daryl? The delay in the chat is driving me crazy. For those of you watching the archive, no, it's not frozen here. See, not frozen. Uh, Melbourne Beach, ooh, nice. Unless, of course, you're swimming in the beach and get attacked by a shark or something. Um, oh, Melbourne Beach, Florida. Oh, uh, I've actually been there. Melbourne Beach, a uh, great place to fish for the almighty snook and tarpon as well, I believe. Um, I think Andre must have stepped out. <laughs> I asked him where he caught it, and he's just disappeared. Andre, did you go out for a beer? What up, dude? It's three pounds. Uh, bigger the fall, hardest place to catch a coho in North America. Wow. Uh, Vancouver, Ambleside Park, 10 minutes from home every morning. Wow. <sighs> you know, some people get excited about food. Some people get excited about members of the opposite sex. Some people get excited about camping. All th kinds of things. To me, it's all about the fish. I love fish. 
Paul House caught a butterfly today. Does that count? <laughs> oh, man. Let it go, but it was in the studio driving me nuts. Now, that's funny. Wow. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I actually have a topic for at least part of today's show. Um, I got an email about three hours ago, um, and the email was preceded by somebody hitting me up on LinkedIn about three days ago, and somebody asking me somewhere else, can't remember when, you know, in the recent past, and, and they all had a similar question, which is, uh, and I, I actually wrote this down. The first person said, what does A&R music mean? What does A&R music mean? Uh, alternate reality? I don't know. Anyway, I, I think what they meant what, was, what does A&R in the music industry mean? So uh, I'm going to clarify that because, you know, if there's one thing I regret about the marketing side of Taxi is that uh, I called it an independent A&R company, and so many people really don't know what A&R is or even what the letters stand for. So I am here today to clarify that for you. And the answer is A&R stands for Artist and Repertoire. Repertoire. My French is so good. So it goes back to the early days in the music industry where oftentimes the artist was not also the songwriter. So the A&R person, and back then uh, it was a very sexist environment. Um, I don't believe there were any women in the A&R field back in like the 1930s, let's say, 40s. Um, and, and the phrase was an A&R man. So if I say A&R man, please don't think of me as being sexist because I'm happy to report that nowadays many, many people who are A&R people uh, in the industry, both on the publishing side and the record label side, are in fact women. Some of the most powerful people in executive positions in the industry are in fact women today. So, yay for that. It's funny, it used to be such a boys club. Deb and I were having this conversation just last night. Um, and she said, oh, it's such a boys club. And I said, no, actually, it's not. Uh, the record industry, maybe on the production side, it, it, it's heavily tilted towards men. Um, but on the executive side, at labels and publishing companies, women are pretty well represented. I don't know that maybe some of the ladies in the business might argue that point with me. But, you know, I know who many of the people are, and I read the trades and look at the websites, and I see women all over the place, so not so much a boys club anymore. Anyway, what does A&R music mean? A&R means artist and repertoire, and back in the day, uh, let's say 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, it, it's, what it means is this is the person at the label who is charged with the responsibility of identifying new talent, wooing that talent, signing that talent, and then figuring out what the repertoire is. Repertoire being the songs, because oftentimes the artist and the songwriter were not necessarily the same person. Although that certainly started to change quite a bit, I would say in the 60s with the advent of uh, rock and roll. Um, you know, the Beatles, might have been among the first, uh, you know, not everything the Beatles did was their own music, but the vast majority of it was. Um, so I would say that that was probably the beginning of the era where the singer-songwriter or what's called a self-contained band started getting signed. But still, to this day, many, many artists are in fact simply artists and they are not necessarily songwriters, although you oftentimes see them mentioned as a co-writer, right? So the a and person would go find an act and then decide what, what were the strengths of that act? You know, was it that they had tremendous vocal range? Was it that they had a cute or unique style? Where did they fit in in the marketplace? Of course, the a and person would consult with other people at their label, like the marketing department, um, the radio promo people, because they wouldn't necessarily just jump on something and you know sign it just 
I'm going to sign you right now. Um, until they took the temperature of what other people in the record company thought about that act. And the reason for that is once you've signed the act and you've made the record, you have to have the other people at the label on board with the whole concept of we're going to get out there and market this act and work to get them on radio and do sales promotions and field promotions, all that kind of stuff, concerts, all that kind of stuff. So the repertoire side, um, think of the Brill Building era, you know, in like the 19, probably late 30s through the 70s, uh, where publishers would sign writers to staff writer gigs. They would throw them all, figuratively speaking, uh, throw them into rooms uh, and pair them up, it, you know, different combinations. Uh, Barry Gordy did it at Hitsville. Um, Motown's, uh, you know, headquarters and studio. Um, they might pair an artist and a writer hoping that they could co-write together. They would probably have five or 10 or 15 different writers that they would pair up in various combinations. Um, this was true of the Brill Building. It was true of the people who created the Philly Sound. It was certainly true in Motown. Uh, and it was also true in Nashville. Nashville's a little bit of a different beast and we'll talk about that in a minute. So once they determined that everybody at the label thought this was a good act to sign, they would go ahead and sign the act and then they would start looking for material and they would look for material that they thought would chart well and would appeal to the program directors at radio. So there you go. That's what an A&R person traditionally did for the longest time. And a lot of people ask the question nowadays um, that everything is so like social media controlled and we live in a very digital world and um, spins on YouTube and spins on Spotify and spins on Pandora and how many followers do you have on your Instagram? All those things matter. It used to be uh, almost as simple as, I guess you could say, that you would sign the act and hopefully the act did their homework before they got signed and built a following and that was usually done by touring and they would start out touring within like a, a local radius of just, let's say, downtown Los Angeles. Then they would expand out to, you know, like Ventura County, maybe Santa Barbara County and San Diego. And the bands would keep going back to the same clubs on kind of a regular schedule a few months apart so that the audience, oh, here comes that band again that I like. And pretty soon they would go from an audience of five people to 25 people to 100 people to 300 people to they've got them lined up out the door and down the sidewalk. That's the point generally when A&R people, at least in the kind of band era of, let's say, the mid 90s through the early 2000s, um, they would look for that. They would look for evidence of a following largely indicated by the number of people that they could draw to a show or draw to many shows. So once they knew that there was smoke um, in, in the context of, you know, there's at least some audience that's interested, then they would go out, sign them, put them together with the right material, whether they created it um, on their own or they brought in material from outside writers. They would make the record and then try to build the audience through radio and touring and other forms of marketing and promotion. So um, that's that. Let's see, what have I left out of that whole thing? So nowadays, what they look for, like I said, is all the evidence that you've built a following in the digital context, especially now in the era of COVID, which nobody can go out there and do any touring or play any club dates, really. Um, there are you know, little bits of that going on, but not a whole lot at the moment, obviously. So A&R has taken on, um, they now have like A&R research people. I, I used to have a friend at Capital and uh, this guy was encyclopedic, which by the way, virtually all A&R people are people who love music. They just love it. They're encyclopedic about it. They know every player on every record. They know who wrote the songs. They know which studio it was recorded at. They know who the co-writers were. They just know all that stuff because it's their passion. So this guy was one of those guys, my friend. He was probably in his mid forties um, and he got a job at Capital as vice president of A&R Research. 
And this was before the internet really took off in a big way, but it was present. And I would say this was probably in the late 90s to early 2000s. And his job, believe it or not, was not to go out to shows on the Hollywood Strip and, and check out acts that were getting a buzz that all the other A&R weasels were all chasing around and checking out because they run around like a rat pack at night um, right after they go out and have dinner on the company credit card. God bless them. Uh, so the A&R research guy or gal, whomever, uh, sits down at a computer all day every day and looks not only for people that are getting added to um, playlists on Spotify um, or making it onto music blogs, but they're looking for people that have developed a following and a buzz. They, they probably gather all the social media. Once they see a band that's got a little something going on, then they probably create a file for them and they watch to see if it grows and they watch to see, oh, are they playing any gigs with any, you know, baby bands that are a couple notches up the tree higher or a couple rungs up the ladder higher than they are. Uh, so they look for all that evidence, but in a different way than they used to, which was simply, can they draw a crowd at a club and how did the crowd react? So now it's all digital. So there's um, kind of a confluence of that digital research as evidence that the audience likes them. And then the label, um, the A&R person who is more of a creative A&R person will look at that act and go, okay, so there's smoke there. Can we make fire out of this by pouring some gasoline on the embers? Um, they might look at the act and go, you know, we've already got uh, three or four acts in that vein already on the label. Number one, we don't want to upset the managers of those acts by signing yet another act like that. We don't want to upset, uh, upset the acts themselves by having too many of a similar thing. Um, I hope this doesn't sound sexist, but I've heard stories um, and, and they're mostly diva related. So please don't hold this against me. It's just truth, okay? But you know, there have been some divas. Um, uh, this is not about Mariah Carey, but she would be a good example of a diva who if her label, which I believe was Columbia Records, um, tried to sign another female diva type artist who also had an incredible vocal range and did similar kind of pop material, that's the label creating a competitor for chart positions and record sales for that act who's already riding the top of the charts and selling tons of records for that label. So an A&R person would actually say, even though this act has a following, um, has a digital, a big digital footprint, has all the makings of a star, they may decide not to bring that act to the president of the label or into an A&R meeting where they kind of vote by committee as to whether or not they're interested because they don't want to create that competition. Um, Nashville, uh, you know, I haven't been to Nashville in many years now, but I used to go very, very often, like six, seven, eight times a year and have many, many friends there. Nashville is a bit more of like a farm system you would sign in baseball, okay, with the, you know, like the local teams, minor leagues, and then um, graduating to the major leagues. So not unusual in Nashville for somebody on the creative side of A&R to identify an act. Um, uh, and Pearson's in the room. So John, uh, tell me if I'm wrong about any of this. But in Nashville, back in the day, maybe to some extent, maybe totally today, they would identify up and coming talent. Sometimes it would be people that moved to Nashville from you know, Wyoming and they were trying to get a break and they were doing writing meetings every day and they had the right look and the good attitude, willing to do the work. All those things are important uh, with any label, but especially in Nashville. Um, and then they might sign that artist to a development deal and give them sort of a, a stipend of maybe, you know, 10 or 20 or $50,000 a year and sign them to a demo deal, which wasn't a full on record deal, but it kept them on a fairly short leash so that somebody else couldn't snap them up. But meanwhile, they weren't making a full on record. They weren't releasing a full on record, but they would, what they would do would be, um, invest in the early stage of that artist's development. 
And while they're doing it, they may also introduce that artist to various writers around town, like our very own John Pearson, and throw them in a room and, and wait to see if there's any combustion, see if any great songs come out of it. So, uh, yep, John says, yes, ML in the 90s, it was a free-for-all. So I would imagine, and I could be wrong about this, but today, um, obviously, country music is different. The audience uh, is probably younger. There's the ongoing battle of traditional country versus what the kids like. A lot of the kids in today's country market have grown up on hip-hop as well, which eventually turned into uh, hip-hop. Um, so now I would imagine that A&R in the context of country music is a combination of the old farm team system combined with uh, today's digital footprint identification going on, and then they probably meld that together. Um, John says he was writing with writers who had Faith Hill and Randy Travis hits. Very cool. <laughs> you don't miss it. Good. And you know what, John? In the long run, and I, I don't mean to sound sarcastic, not to you, but I mean to anybody in the industry about this, doing what you're doing and doing the film and TV thing, in the long run, you will be doing a much better job of building a steady income and a retirement income doing what you're doing than you know, struggling for years to get that one cut and hoping that that cut is a hit and then hoping you can follow up that hit with another cut and another hit. Uh, as you and I both know really, really well, they're really only like, I don't know, what, 10, 20 guys in Nashville that are doing that, it, you know, um, at any point in time. Um, Paul House says, I totally believe that, Michael. Well, thank you, Paul. You're a trusting soul. <laughs> Uh, no, it's true. I, you know, people are always like, why are you pushing the film and TV so much, Lasko? Well, it's because I believe in it. I, my mission as the owner of Taxi is to make sure that as many members as, as possible um, are able to live their dream of having a bunch of people, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, hear their music and for them to be able to earn either a side income or their entire income with that music having the ability to retire and have your catalog of music still out there in many different places and earning money well into the future, I think is better than having a 401k. Um, so it's great on all those levels. Um, writing artist stuff is a grind. Um, I don't know if I've ever told you guys this or, or told you specifically about this, John, but uh, uh, of course, you know who Jeffrey Steele is. Um, probably one of the, you know, top country songwriters uh, of the last couple of decades. Um, he's written a lot of big hits for a lot of big acts. He's extremely gregarious. He's an incredible performer. He was in a band called Boy Howdy, and he's just he's he's a ball of fire. That one. Um, and I've known Jeffrey for. 20 years probably um uh, one of his public actually two of his publishers um became really good friends of mine and i met him through them and then he and i became very friendly as well um i know his wife um i know his daughter uh i know his daughter via email and telephone i don't think we've ever met face to face anyway so one day um one of our taxi screeners who was uh a hit songwriter in the, the pop world um, came into my office and she said, uh, there's a big country songwriter in town doing writing meetings. His name is Jeffrey Steele. And I went, oh, I know him really well. And she said, yeah, he had a, a meeting cancel on him at four o'clock this afternoon. He's holed up in a hotel in Hollywood and he wants to write with somebody younger and fresher um, and my publisher is his publisher. They reached out to me if, and asked if I could recommend anybody. And she referred my daughter, Hannah. And my daughter, Hannah, went over and co-wrote a song with Jeffrey Steele and one other writer. So, yay, go, Hannah. Um, so there you go. So 
Yeah, what does A&R music mean, which was the question I got asked. No, it, it's what does an A&R person do? What's the definition of A&R, artist and repertoire? Now you know what they do. And let's see if I've got anything else in my notes that we should talk about that. Um, Oh, somebody said, is the era of the A&R guy over? And it's not. Uh, it, it's taken on a different form. You know, sometimes A&R people are writer producers themselves and they're out in the world and they're super well connected on social media, let's say, and they're developing talent on their own. It's not unheard of for somebody who has identified a fresh new talent um, be it a band or, or a, a single act. Um, they co-write with that person, they produce tracks, they bring it to the label, the label falls in love with it, the label signs the act and the uh, label turns to the writer producer who found the act and developed the act and said, hey, if you could bring that kind of mojo to this act, might you be capable of doing that for other acts? Um, and mostly out of fear of them not wanting that writer producer to perform that same magic trick at another label, it's not unheard of for them to give like a, a three year contract to that writer producer and name them VP of A&R uh, and give them, you know, an annual salary of a half a million dollars a year or something uh, and then a signing budget of X amount of dollars. So. There you go. Now you know everything you ever needed to know about what A&R means in the music industry. Boom. Mic drop. I hear the makings of a TV show, my daughter Hannah. <laughs> no, Hannah kind of likes to stay on the down low now. Um, she actually appeared on a couple of taxi TV episodes when she was about 15 or 16 years old. I got to say, the, the kid started writing really good songs with really strong hooks at a very early age. Um, and, and basically, uh, not basically, entirely did homeschool for her high school so she could sit in her room all day on her bed with her acoustic guitar writing songs. And uh, she, what was I going to say about Hannah? Oh. Um, she's weird. <laughs> My kid is weird. Uh, she doesn't like the spotlight. Uh, she doesn't like to talk about her accomplishments. Uh, when she used to act in a lot of like, uh, you know, local theater group plays, oftentimes got the lead, oftentimes knocked it out of the park. We would give her flowers at the end of the show and give her a hug. Congratulations, you did a great job. And if I dared to play a video of her in a scene or talk to her or compliment her on the car ride home, she would just freak out. She didn't want to do it. And uh, so anyway, but she is out of show business now, um, doing something much different. And yeah, she likes to stay in the background. Uh, Edmund Wren, previously asked question, what catalog management companies do? What's the difference between them and music publishers? Um, I'm not really sure what a catalog management company does other than I have some friends that do catalog management for legacy catalogs of songwriters or artists who've passed away and they manage their stuff because more so than plugging in that context, it's about people reaching out uh, like for Nat King Cole songs, maybe. Um, trying to think of some other stuff. Buddy Holly, you know, people who have just like massive footprints, big careers, and uh, the family inherits the catalog when the person passes away, they don't know what to do with it. So they will generally bring somebody on who is the catalog manager, um, and their job is to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Exploit the catalog. So they're exploiters is what they are. But just from my own personal observation, I could be wrong about this, but I think I'm right. More often than not, their job is answering the phone, answering emails from people reaching out to them, say, how much would it cost to license this song? How much would it cost to license this master if it was a master that um, was either owned by the artist or had reverted back to the artist from the label or whatever situation that was? Um, 
So I'm not sure that a catalog manager uh, would represent somebody who's not legacy. I, I guess they could. I just don't have a great answer for you, Edmund. I'd only be guessing. Um, Buddy Hooley is my favorite of all. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm presuming you met Buddy Holly there, Rick. Uh, who doesn't love Buddy Holly? Um, there's a, a documentary that I've seen most of in pieces um, about Buddy Holly's sons remaking some of his stuff or founding some of his lost music and, and bringing it back to life. Um, and it was incredible. Uh, I'm not Buddy Holly. Who am I thinking of? Oh, shoot. Totally. But I do love Buddy Holly. Um, who did Crying in My Sleep? And... Uh, Oh gosh, not Buddy Holly. Um, big glasses, pretty woman, Roy Orbison. Uh, Roy Orbison, uh, there's a documentary about Roy Orbison that is incredible. Um, yeah, exploit as it pertains to intellectual property is a good word. Cass McKenty wants to be in the Sears catalog. <laughs> Edmund Red's got another question. Uh, when do you think taxi members should hire a manager? You know what? That's a great question. I'm actually going to give Ariana a pose. There you go, Ari. Um... When should a taxi member hire a manager? Great question, and it's a tricky answer, believe it or not. Um, and I mean this in the kindest way, but there are very few things in the world that will get an artist uh, more excited than somebody saying, man, I love what you're doing. I would love to manage you. 99.9% .9 of the time, the person saying that is a fan of yours who's seen your shows at the club, um, has some connection to you, could possibly be, uh, oftentimes they are successful business people, they are sometimes lawyers, um, they are all well-intentioned, passionate fans of your music, and you get excited because you think, finally, somebody who appreciates me ah oh, that feels so good and it's so exciting to think that i could have somebody else doing all that businessy stuff that i'm not gonna do because i don't have the time even though i want to do it i don't get around to it and surely if i have a manager um, especially somebody who's proven him or herself uh, by being an attorney or a successful business person uh, if they've been successful at that, then possibly they can be successful with my music. So sure, let's sign a management deal. Um, that's, it's a bad move. And here's why. Uh, you want a manager that has connections in the industry, um, especially if you're trying to be an artist. You want a manager that has connections at radio. You want a manager who has lots of connections in the media, um, be that printed media, online media, TV media. You want a manager who has had an act um, on a major label or several acts on major labels before. You want a manager who has had the experience of having two or three acts on the road uh, and getting the phone calls in the middle of the night that they're pissed off about things not going well on the road. You don't necessarily need your manager, you don't want your manager actually to also be your road manager, but um, you want your manager to be well-connected, heavily experienced, and have the right business etiquette and the right business chops that they can go in and get you signed or make sure that once you're signed that all the people at the label are excited about you and doing their jobs well, all that stuff. So if you get that well-meaning real estate attorney in Chillicothe, Ohio, that happens to see one of your shows and then comes to five or 10 of your shows over a period of a year and has your CD and brings their friends to your show and they are just, just brimming with excitement and passion for your music and you're so flattered and it feels so good and this person they're they're a lawyer damn it what better 
you know, person could I have representing me than an attorney? Um, don't do that deal. Absolutely do not do that deal. No matter how much you like them personally, no matter how genuine uh, they are, no matter how excited they are about your music, no matter how flattering they are to you. I've seen this personally happen with my own eyes on several, if not many occasions. The band gets the local manager, that person I just described. <clears throat> then all of a sudden they get a record deal and or they're getting um, courted by a record label and the record label says so how do you feel about your manager i love my manager you know my manager uh got me enough shows book that it got your attention and here we are having the meeting today by the way where is my manager in, in the in the restroom in, in the company cafeteria where's my manager well while your manager's out of the room we'd just like to talk to you for a moment would you be adverse to upgrading to a professional manager somebody that we have a relationship with, a good working relationship with, somebody who's got a track record. Ooh, oh really? I could get Blink-182's manager or I could get uh, Ed Sheeran's manager, really? Wow, oops, and then your real manager, your current manager walks back in the room from the cafeteria and uh, everybody's very hush-hush. And then after that meeting, um, you get texts, you get phone calls from your A&R person at the label, maybe even the president of the label going, so have you had a chance to think about that? You know, how, how do you feel about um, possibly severing your relationship with your manager? Well, I'm really tempted, man. I'd love to go with Ed Sheeran's manager, but you know, I signed a contract with my manager, the real estate lawyer from Chillicothe uh, about two and a half years ago. Um, well, what, what if we could help you get out of that contract? Really? So now you're stabbing somebody in the back that got you to where you are today because your career means everything to you and you may be the best, most kind-hearted person with tons of character, but very few people will say no to the offer I just described. And they will, in fact, cut their manager loose, their first manager, but here comes the rub. And the rub is that your contract with the first manager, if that person had any little semblance of knowledge of the industry, and they probably looked this up online, they put a clause in that contract, which is called a sunset clause, meaning that they can't force you to stay signed to them. Um, that's uh, legally akin, I believe, to like indentured servitude. So a management contract can be broken at any time, but it's totally kosher for the manager to ask you to sign a contract that's got a sunset clause, meaning, okay, let's say we've got a five-year deal um, and the manager is getting, let's say, 20% for managing you. So now you dump the manager in year, at the end of year number two and you got three years left. Well, the manager in the sunset clause, it states in the document that you signed that you have to pay them 15% for any money you make in year number three, 10% in year number four, and 5% in year number five. So guess what that means? That means either that money comes out of your pocket on top of the 20% you're gonna give the new big time manager or it means the new big time manager is gonna say, sorry, um, I don't wanna split my income with that person that you're stuck with, I'm out. So to answer your question, maybe more directly, Edmund, the time to get a manager is when a real manager with real industry experience comes to you and says, I wanna manage you. And in my personal observation over many, many years and seeing a lot of different aspects of this industry, I can tell you that that almost always happens when you are offered a record deal or a big publishing deal. Managers don't wanna sign acts that they have to develop very often. There are always exceptions to every rule, but I'm the kind of guy that likes to go with the odds. They don't like to sign a baby band that's gonna take a lot of time and energy and probably some money on their part on the possibility that they can get that act signed or break them and make a lot of money. 
they find it much easier and much more profitable and much quicker to the pot of money at the end of the rainbow by finding an act that has done all the homework and is ready to break. And that's really when you need a manager. Um, because if you try to manage yourself, you will probably blow it. Having a well-meaning relative, no. Having a well-meaning real estate attorney from Chillicothe, Ohio, not a good idea. So a manager will come to you when the time is right. There's my answer. And I'm sticking with it. Wow. All right, so I've been ignoring the chat so I could say that stuff without sounding like uh, I was a, a, an ADD patient or something. Um, Pete, Mike, Pete Mason was paying attention. He says, great advice, Michael. Dan Weber says, you guys cracked me up. And I know what I was saying wasn't funny, so what are they doing that's so damn funny? Cass had a manager in the 80s who kept me busy, priceless. Hard to find, too. Uh, you're welcome, Edmund. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't try and hold a candle to my stories, John, because if you did, I'd be burned. Any other questions as long as we uh, have nine minutes left to go? Oh, I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying um, Ohio is not the center of the music industry in the USA. <laughs> Although, you know, um, so many people still identify the music capitals as LA, New York, and Nashville, um, and Atlanta certainly now for urban music, and it's been that way for easily a decade or more. Um, you know, with the advent of the internet, social media, all that stuff, I think that the music capitals are a little less important. It used to be you had to go to LA, you had to go to New York, you had to go to Nashville. Um, it certainly couldn't hurt, but it's not as easy as I'm the most talented person in the world. And I just got off the bus yesterday in Nashville. And the first person that hears one of my songs is going to go, holy crap, you're amazing. And then they're going to walk you right over to a record label. You're going to get signed to a deal. And then a manager is going to want to sign you. Um, and then a publisher is going to want to sign you. And then a publicist is going to want to sign you. And then a business manager who handles your money and probably steals it is going to want to sign you. Um, and then a music attorney is going to want to work with you. And before you're done and after you pay taxes, you're going to end up with about 20% of all the money you make as a signed artist. So think about that. That's why I choose film and TV music every time. Um, I vote for Miami. So do I, Jan Weilich. I love Miami. Uh, do I hear any, whoa, 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 whoa. Do I hear any more about the result of the Capitol Records fire? Um, which Capitol Records fire? Am I missing something? What are we talking about? Uh, and while I'm waiting for an answer on that question, how many di dispatch briefs? Uh, about four per week. Sometimes it's three, sometimes it's five, but averaging it out, uh, we try and get them out um, every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday. Sometimes the days will change accordingly. Oh, by the way, um, hey, Britt Fox, hello. Uh, big news. We just got 11 new listings in the door hours ago today that will be all coming out um, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, I believe, uh, the music supervisor of an independent film coming back for his second or third time to taxi uh, for music for an independent film he's working on um, and had 11 different listings and they need the stuff pretty soon. So we're trying to get those listings out the door in a hurry. So you will see them popping up in your daily emails. So open every one of those taxi emails for the next few days, uh, open them every day. But for the next few days, you're going to see two or three or four of those listings per day, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Don't miss out. Um, this gentleman has used music from much music from taxi members, I believe, in the last film that he worked on. Oh, the Universal Vault Fire? Is that what you're talking about? Um, anyway... Um, yeah, watch out for those. Um, not instrumentals. I believe that it's mostly songs, if not entirely songs. Uh, 
how much of a focus is the record side of the business for taxi these days? I got to say, more so in the last year than it was in the two or three years prior to that. Um, after the record industry was pretty well decimated by all the file sharing services, which I am not a fan of, um, and then the industry started having a comeback um, due to streaming and it got healthier again. Um, we've been getting more country listings lately than we have in several years and a lot of pop listings. By the way, we just brought on a new screener who is a personal friend of mine who is a hit songwriter, um, mostly in the urban and pop side of the industry. Um, I, I was so shocked when he said yes that he would do it, but I'm really thrilled that uh, you guys have an amazing set of ears. We don't know how long he's going to stick around because he could end up having another hit right away and boom, he's gone. Um, he's still really busy, still working on stuff all the time. Uh, all I can tell you is he's a really smart guy, a really good guy, and has great ears for pop and urban pop kind of stuff. And jazz as well, I believe. Universal Vault Fire, lots of masters gone. Yeah, actually, I'm not well, I'm, I'm um, well aware of it, but not well informed <laughs> on the subject. Yeah, you know, uh, honestly, um, Darren, I haven't done an actual count for a year probably, but at some point, about a year or so ago, I did talk to the guys in the A&R department and said, dudes, we are running so much film and TV stuff that for our members who are purely songwriters wanting to pitch them to artists on labels and for artists who want to get deals on labels, we're just not running that many listings. So... Um, they've made a concerted effort. And uh, actually, oftentimes we reach out through our screeners, like uh, this friend of mine that's joining the, the, he just got trained, as a matter of fact, I believe, like Friday of last week. Um, you know, somebody like that is super duper well connected. So we may reach out to him and say, hey, have you heard of anything juicy floating around out there in the street? Oh yeah, I know, you know, XYZ artist is looking for material right now. Well, can you connect them with us and find out that if we run a listing and don't disclose who they are and everything, you're the final set of ears before it goes back to them, would they be interested? And I would say 80 or 90% of the time, those situations work out in your favor. 457, where does the time for go? <laughs> bego, bego, I can't talk. Um, Uh, Brett Fox wants to know, Michael, what are your thoughts on the Motown model um, where you take inexperience and transform them by being the one shop writing, producing, and arranging music for records? Um, that model still exists and thrives actually in some places. Um, there's an A&R person who's very famous for doing that. His name is Mike Karen. Uh, and I believe he might be president of A&R Worldwide at Atlantic. Um, there are also production companies, writer producers that have like little mini Motowns, you know, where they have a farm team and they co-write and, and produce the tracks and develop the artists. Um, yeah, those things are still in existence and, and they work. What differences do you need to write for recording artists versus film and TV? Um, film and TV, universal lyrics, and the song shouldn't steal the scene. Writing for an artist, um, you need to know what that artist you're pitching to typically cuts, what they've had hits with, write something that fits that artist's whole vibe, and write it with a chorus that people can't stop singing after they've only heard the first chorus one time through. Um, you want the producer and the manager and the A&R person for a signed artist to hear something. Let's say the door you go through, let's say you get forwarded to a producer through a taxi listing and the producer lights up and goes, wow, this is really good for that uh, Ariana Grande record that I'm gonna be working on in September. 
So at that point, the producer is probably smart enough to go to the manager rather than going directly to Ariana Grande and saying, here you go, I've got your next hit. Probably go to the manager and let the manager um, get on board with it because strategically, the artist is le less likely to trust the A&R person than they are their own manager. And the manager wants to look heroic, so you gotta think strategically about this stuff. Managers always wanna look heroic because they wanna justify the 20% that they're making. So a, a smart producer who finds a song would probably go to the manager and go, hey, what do you think, Ralph? And Ralph goes, wow, I like this. And if you're really smart when you present to the manager, you go, you know, I heard this the other day. I'm not sure if it's really good or if it's really great or, you know, who I should pitch it to. Would you have a listen and just tell me what you think? The manager listens and goes, man, this would be perfect for Ariana. I can't believe that you didn't think of that. <laughs> Embedding the thought that they, the manager, thought of that. Uh, is it cool if I take it to Ariana? Why, sure, go ahead. Then the manager takes it to Ariana. Ariana trusts her manager. Um, the, R, the manager gets a gold star for earning his or her 20%. Ariana falls in love with the song. And then the producer, the manager, and Ariana go into an A&R meeting at the label and say, we want to cut that song and we want to make it the single on the next album. So I hope that answered the question. Excuse me, I need a little swig of Rockstar and then I'm gonna sign off because we are done. <laughs> we should produce a pre-show where Ariana gets more to say. And write to what the artist will sing to the future. That's a great point, John. Anything you hear on the radio today, even if it's just coming out as a single today, that song was written probably, you know, 18 months ago to three years ago. Um, it was probably recorded a year to 18 months ago. There's, you know, the, the run-up time for the release of an album. So artists are always looking for the next thing, not the last thing, but the last thing is the springboard to the next thing. Excuse me, that was, there you go, Rockstar Burp on mic. Michael Sparty, I won't bother you about this anymore, but it is impossible to start a broadcast at noonish uh, one day a week for a month. I don't know, Michael. Um, I just don't know. Honestly, it, it's really hard. As much as I love doing these shows every day, and I really do, I look forward to it. It's kind of like, it's like my lunch hour every day, hanging out with you guys, and I don't have to do nearly as much prep work for these as I do for regular taxi TV. But it does break up my day, and usually, I mean, like, I ate lunch today 20 minutes before I started this show. Uh, I started working at 8 o'clock this morning and uh, had so many different um, meetings on, on Zoom, a couple on WhatsApp today, uh, a 45 minute phone call with the sponsor guy for the road rally, just boom, 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 boom. And it'd be really hard for me to do a show earlier in the day as much as I would love to make you happy. That's the big impact part of my day. After I finish the show, some days I just look at my email, look at my phone, see if there are any emergencies from the staff. And I might just, you know, start cooking dinner at 5.15 or 5.30 and then start working again at eight. So. The first half of the day is really, really hard to do. I'm so sorry, but thank you for understanding. All right, uh, time to actually tonight for dinner, and I am gonna run to the grocery store shortly. I am going to make um, pho, you know, like Vietnamese pho, or if you pronounce it correctly, it's pho uh, noodle soup um, with chunks of fish in it. So that's, a, we need a cooking show. Oh, come on, you guys. Um, <laughs> ooh, you have a Blackstone grill? I am so jealous. Although I do have a bullet smoker. Um, yeah, it's hot here too, but we have air conditioning. 
<laughs> All right, you guys, have a great night. See you tomorrow. And don't forget, uh, tomorrow I am going to call Russell Landwehr. And if I'm in a particularly good mood, maybe I'll call a couple of other people because I do like getting you guys on the phone and seeing what up. Paul House, does anybody have a butterfly recipe? Uh, butterfly shrimp, yeah. <laughs> See you guys tomorrow. Have a great night. Thanks for joining us. Oh, don't forget, like us. Thanks. Bye, you guys.